we will call this October 28, 2019 regular meeting of the Carmel Clay School Board to order. First, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. And second, we have two very special presentations this evening to acknowledge the accomplishments of some of our high school students. Uh, Madam Secretary, roll call, please. Mr. President, all board members are present tonight. Thank you, and we will note that uh, Dr. Dudley is out of town this evening, so she is not at the meeting. Um, please rise for the pledge, led by Scout Charles Haas. start with our two presentations this evening I just want to let each group know that after the presentation for that group uh, we will take a brief pause to take a photograph parents are welcome to take a photo at the same time um, and then after the second group which the pause will not be as long um, we will take a break um, from our meeting we understand it is a school night and if you don't want to stay for the whole meeting, you will not hurt our feelings. Um, however, I do want to throw it out there that one of our presentations tonight is an update on the designs for our two new schools. So if you want a sneak peek, uh, I encourage you to stay for that. Uh, I'm sure that will be a great presentation along with some other uh, non-normal business presentations. Um, and while I have your attention, I'm going to remind everyone that next Tuesday evening, November 5th, next Tuesday evening, next Tuesday, November 5th, not during the evening, is election day, so please vote. Um, we will move to the first item presentation, uh, National Merit Semifinalist, Dr. Harmis. Good evening. The academically talented seniors we honor this evening uh, have a prestigious designation by scoring in the top 1% of the PSAT taken in 2018. There were 22,000 schools and 1.6 million students who took this test. And the 48 students from Carmel High School that we honor tonight are in the top 1%. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Being named a semifinalist is just the first step. Each of the students in this past month, or in the month of September, completed additional applications and submitted those to be considered for the National Merit Finalist status. Not only did they submit proof of their excellent academic record that confirms the PSAT scores, but they also secured recommendations from various staff members. They will be notified in February 2020, and we look forward to hearing who has made National Merit Finalist. At this time, Melinda Steffen will introduce the National Merit Semifinalist, and again, there are 48, so be patient. <laughs> Students, once you have been introduced and you have your certificate if you would go ahead and come up here and shake hands with the board stay up here remember guys there's 48 of you you're smart enough to figure out how to figure that out <laughs> so give yourselves a little bit of room uh, and then we'll take a picture afterwards okay Melinda Dr. Beresford and members of the board, I am most pleased to introduce you to our class of 2020 Carmel High School National Merit Semifinalists. Aiden Ashodi. <laughs> Shivani Balachander. <laughs> Jacob Beach.
Viha Bayanagari. Suhas Chundi. Colette Klaus. Anushka Dasgupta. Emily Deldar. Eleanor Didas. Dias, sorry. We actually had a conversation about how to say that today and I still messed it up. Sorry, Eleanor. Sydney Edwards. Claire Fisher. Cameron Hillsman. Dayun Hong. Jacqueline Her. Ditya Iyer. Oh. <laughs> Elena Johnson Glazer. Tara Candalu. <laughs> Jehi Kim. <laughs> Zoe Coniaris. <laughs> Aditi Kumar. Raphael Lee. <laughs> Hannah Lu. Ude Lamada. <laughs> Ishandeep Oberoi <laughs> Justin Pallada <laughs> Monish Pandey Bennett Ring. <laughs> Kian Robinson. <laughs> Madeline Sailors. <laughs> Logan Sandlin. Andrew Shawig. <laughs> Nicole Segarin. <laughs> oh. 
Rohil Sanapati. Noah Sim. Yannick Singh. Julia Sweet. Kieran Thomas. <laughs> Rhea Verma. <laughs> Harry Wang. Jerry Wang. <laughs> Michael Wang. Nathan Wang. Lisa Warren. <laughs> Lena Wasim. <laughs> Natalie Wells. Iris Yan. <laughs> Brian Zhang. <laughs> Christopher Zhao. Members of the audience and school board, please join me in congratulating our National Merit Semi-Finalists.
The girls. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The girls. Very good. Ah. meetings because I always have expedition. little writing prompts. Mm -hmm. And I'm always a critical one, so I'm like, oh, why don't you read it too? <laughs> I always tell them to read it out loud, because when they get it out of their head, they just sound I mean, this is so good. I mean, I always write things out several times, and then I paste it in. I don't go to the final product and start <laughs> thinking. Right. <laughs> I mean, his are awful. <laughs> These are several running because, well, you know, grammar is not my best subject. I'm like, which is why we start earlier yes. and have multiple iterations oh, all year. So oh, get that was my last, so that was last night. I was doing well. Alexander's doing really well. He's struggling socially. Um, but other than that, he's at Butler. Yes. 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 And so we are very fortunate that he's close enough yeah. because we have, yes, there's been. A lot of support this year, more so than last year. Hi. Before we get to the second presentation, hi. I know. Yeah. yeah. All right, we still have one more presentation, so if, if everyone would stay, that would be appreciated. Also, I'd like to congratulate the students on this miraculous achievement, and I'd like to point out, normally we hear that Carmel High School has more national merit semifinalists than some states, so... Um, this does not go past us as a, while there are a lot of you here, we recognize the uh, select group that you are from across the country, so congratulations, um, and it just shows what a great community, what a great school we have, great parents, great students. I'm going to turn the second presentation uh, again to Dr. Harmus. It is the International Biology Olympiad Gold Medalist. I did want to uh, bring this up 
and Suhas Chandi was not uh, able to be with us this evening, but this, uh, this summer he went to Europe. And, you know, besides being third in state wrestling and a national merit semifinalist, Suhas won the, the International Biology Olympiad gold medal. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that even though he wasn't going to be here this evening, that we could recognize Sue Haas. All right, now we will pause. For those of you that don't want to stay and see what the new buildings are going to look like, if you have homework, we will understand. Thank you. Kid I was talking to. Uh, next on the agenda is public comment. I assume Mrs. Nobis, Nobis, we have nobody to speak. Thank you. Next, we'll move to consent. On the consent agenda, we have approval of the personnel report, claims, payroll, approval of gifts. We've got um, gifts from the Carmel Elementary PTO, an anonymous donor to Forest Dale, um, Creekside Performing Arts, and Martin Marietta, donation to Carmel High School. We also have approval of the workshop minutes from September 9th, the regular session minutes from September 23rd, the minutes from October 2nd special session, the minutes from October 7th special section. Uh, may I have a motion to approve consent? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? There being none, we'll all vote. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we move to information. Um, the one item for information is design development presentation for Carmel Elementary School and the new elementary school at Clay Center Road. Uh, Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Uh, this evening our architects are going to present uh, what we've referred to as the design development stage of these projects. Uh, 
you'll see that there's been some changes uh, since the last time they reported to you. And, and again, we're, we're a ways from having, you know, all the details of the building. That, that'll start next. But, uh, but there is uh, better insight now as to what the uh, inside of the building and the outside will look like, as well as site placement and so forth. So with that, I'm not sure who else is going to present. But Brent, uh, so Brent Height's going to start at least with uh, CSO. Well, good evening, Dr. Beresford, Mr. Kushner, uh, ladies of the board. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here again this evening with you. Um, we will uh, hopefully get you guys kind of updated. We've, we're back, I think, in August last. Um, so hopefully give you an update of what we've been up to the last couple months. As uh, Mr. McMichael alluded to, we are kind of in that stage where we're finalizing all the design of everything and starting to get into those details of how things are put together, where they're going to go, and then any of those small refinements. So. A lot of what you, you'll see tonight here, especially at first, is stuff you've probably seen before, just there's be small refinements that we've continued to develop. Um, overall, looking at our schedule, um, we're kind of finishing up that construction document period. So that, that finishes this month. Um, and we'll start uh, bidding for uh, Clay Center Road. The, two, the site package and foundations and steel have already been bid and approved by the board. Um, so it'll be for this site, it'll be the, um, just the building, the MEP systems, and the site improvements like the playground equipment and things like that that'll, that are still to bid. Um, and then we'll start construction um, as soon as we can. They're ho I think we got a permit last week, so we should be starting to move dirt out on the site very, very soon. Um, for Carmel, we are, that, that project is following a little bit, not, not falling behind, but following behind. Um, so we will be in construction documents through about mid, -Novem mid to late November, um, and then we'll bid that project during the month of December, um, and construction will start the first of the year. I think it will actually start towards March, um, just because the ground will be frozen, um, so they can't do a whole lot up to that point, but the uh, construction manager will be able to mobilize and get, get his forces ready to start. Um, and then, of course, as everyone knows, these buildings will be open for the 2021 and 2022 school year. Uh, the overall floor plan, this should really look very, very similar to what you guys have seen before. We have not made many modifications to really since the schematic design floor plan that we developed with the leadership group um, here from Carmel. Uh, you'll see the different activity commons around with classroom surrounding uh, as each grade level has their own kind of wing. Uh, the cafeteria, gym, main entry up in top center and the discovery center. We'll zoom in on these real quick um, and I'm happy to come back later uh, if there are specific questions on anything. Um, again, very similar to what you guys have seen before. Main entry at the very front of the building with the admin. That is a secure vestibule. Um, all parents will have to enter through there during the school hours. Um, we've been through the kind of hardware coordination about you know locking and releasing those and scheduling with electronic hardware. Um, so it's all very sophisticated and complicated, but uh, I think we've got it all worked out. Um, the clinic and guidance counselors are kind of in the bottom portion that you see there, um, just north of the Discovery Center. Um, as you come down that main corridor, uh, the Discovery Center is on one side, and then the stage is on the other. There are some large platform steps that lead up to the stage, so that's kind of a gathering spot. Um, there's an overhead glass garage door that kind of opens up um, just to kind of um, add some free flow up to the stage or for, for an informal presentation um, that, that kind of adds an additional use for that stage that often kind of sits empty during the day um, and expands kind of the space of the Discovery Center. Uh, there's another overhead door on the Discovery Center directly opposite that hallway so that you can really kind of have a nice free flow through that hallway opening up. Uh, we all often talk about uh, removing barriers uh, to things from students inside the school. So if we can remove barriers to the Discovery Center or, or Media Center as it's traditionally called, um, that's, that's all the better. Um, there is a small p space south of the maker space, or south of the Discovery Center, that's the maker space. Um, I think this is going to be left a lot to the uh, local campuses to really decide what goes in those spaces and how they're used. Um, but we definitely heard that there was a, a desire and a need for kind of a messy space for kids to be able to make things and uh, work on projects and, and things like that. Um, coming down further south, there is a main corridor running uh, kind of, well, on the side it's north-south, but on the plans it's east-west. Um, and then there's the large group instruction, um, staff dining room, and then art and music are both located there. The music room is um, acoustically rated around, so that there, that there will not be or should not be any sound bleed into the adjacent classrooms or discovery center that would be disruptive. 
moving over to the kind of gym cafeteria and stage setup, this is very similar to several of your other facilities. Um, it seems to work really well. There is an operable, a large operable wall between the cafeteria and gym, so that can open up for uh, large convocations or for parent night, um, things like that. If there's a the Christmas performance on the stage, um, and then the cafeteria there is towards the back with the main mechanical areas support. Um, the loading dock is kind of to the north, but screened by a large masonry wall, which you'll see later in images. Um, and this is just a zoom in on a typical kind of activity commons. Again, very similar to what you guys have seen before. There are uh, five classrooms situated, or situated around an activity commons, so that's kind of a flex space. They all have glass double doors that open up out to them so that um, there can be a real nice free flow from the classroom into those spaces should the teacher desire to let kids kind of break out and do project-based learning or things like that um, or they can close those doors and if they need to have a more quiet environment they can do that as well um, the cubbies uh, are located kind of where it says coats between each classroom um, so students would enter that way hang up their stuff go into the classroom door and hang out there um, there is a small group room located between each pair of classrooms. Um, the only variation to that is the kindergarten wing. Because the kindergarten classrooms have um, restrooms inside of the classrooms, uh, the small group rooms are actually more on the activity commons side of things. So there are still, I believe, two activity commons for the kindergarten wing. They're just not situated between each pair of um, classrooms. Um, and then I'll also note that each um, grade level or each pair of grade levels shares an outdoor learning lab. Um, so that is a fenced um, gated area where it, so it's secure and safe um, where kids can come outside and run around. Um, and they can do outdoor stuff. Um, we're not doing a whole lot of landscaping or anything in those courtyards just from a maintenance perspective that can sometimes be problematic but a lot of the um, teachers and even our other clients that we've worked with have that put like planter beds out there for kids to grow you know vegetables and have a garden and, and things like that and I think there was a lot of interest when we had focus group meetings with teachers kind of engaging in that so we're going to leave that kind of up to them something that they can fill in that piece as uh, time goes on um, so we'll start with Clay Center Road um, this is the overall site plan uh, this has been approved by the BZA we are good to go we had a second meeting today about um, the, the lighting for the baseball fields um, and the signage and happy to happy to report that we got approved for those variances so we're going to proceed forward um, zooming in just on the school I'll describe quickly the site circulation again this is relatively unchanged um, in, parents will enter and exit at the north entry um, if they're dropping off they'll turn in that first drive come south and circle around to the front entry there's it's a double stacked queuing lane so we should be able to get a significant amount of cars there I believe it's like a 150 to 180 cars off the street uh, before we start backing up traffic so the idea is to get as much traffic off of Clay Center Road as possible um, if they if staff are still filtering in during that parent drop-off time they can just go up to the second dri second drive as they enter and turn right into the parking lot park and walk in um, the bus loading and is an entry as well as the service is all on the south drive so that keeps it completely separate from parent traffic which is a very very good thing um, buses will come in the south drive circle around to the back of the building and dis once everyone's there they'll dismiss or pick up um, the service entry um, at the south side of the building there is a gate there so that service vehicles can't come back to the bus loading area during school hours some of that bus loading hard surface does double as hard surface play area for like basketball courts and four square and things like that um, and then you'll see the two playgrounds for Clay Center Road um, that's a little bit different at Carmel I can point that out um, but the kindergarten playground uh, at Carmel we do have the early childhood program which we do not have at Carmel Elementary so there's initial two classrooms and some support spaces for those programs and then there's the upper level playground kind of back towards the, the tree line back here um, so this is a quick video of what you can expect to see um, and I will try to narrate as we go so you're coming around the kind of what the entry sequence would be if you're a parent coming in to drop off uh, we're going to start on the south side of the building where there's the that's the loading dock you're seeing now um, the big tall volume space is the cafeteria and the gymnasium um, so those windows you see there look into the cafeteria there is a s secure courtyard there for kids to eat outside should the weather permit um, and then into the main entry there 
moving this direction, that first wing is the admin area, so all those windows will go into offices. Small courtyard here off the media center, and then our first two academic wings with the shared courtyard in the middle. Um, I will note that we'll see uh, an additional video of Carmel Elementary, and um, so you'll see some of this again if it is moving a little fast for you. Um, on this end, you'll see the, the bump out here. That's the two additional early childhood classrooms. Um, there is an entry here, so that entry would be the main north-south corridor that connects the whole building. Um, and then we'll come around to the back. All these windows go into classrooms. Um, and then we're going to come around the back side of the building where the bus lot is. And you'll see two more additional classroom pods or grade levels with the courtyard between them. And then a larger courtyard here, um, kind of a rear entry for the building. And uh, the LGI and staff dining and art rooms are all on this side. And then the last two academic pods with a courtyard in between. We're going to zoom in a little bit on this one to give you a better, better view. Um, that gr there's an overhead garage door straight back that opens up. And then there's another one on the cafeteria wall so that you can get a real nice free flow through there um, should there ever need to be something like that. And the windows on each side of that are the activity commons in each grade level. So coming around this side, you'll see, again, windows into classrooms. And then this is the other side of that north-south corridor, uh, kind of an entry exit into there, mainly for emergency egress purposes. Um, you've got the service area, uh, mechanical yard, all screened, and then the loading dock area uh, where trucks will drop off during the day. And then we'll swing back out. Uh, moving to the inside of the building, um, our interior designers have worked really hard to put together two color palettes, one for each school. Um, so in this image, you'll see the, the hallway is actually carpet. Um, it's just a carpet that kind of looks like a paver tile. Um, the walls have porcelain tile, kind of a wainscot for wall protection. Um, we've moved away from a lot of CMU block walls, um, one from a cost standpoint and a labor standpoint. Masons are hard to find. Um, it's becoming a very, very valued trade. Um, as well as it's quicker to build with a metal stud and gypsum board. But with that comes the challenge of how do we protect the wall so that we're not having to, you know, paint them every year or, you know, patch and repair things. So uh, wall tiles are one, uh, one material we use quite a bit that does that really well. It's cleanable, um, so that, and it kind of gives a more of a, I don't know, nicer aesthetic. It's a more homey aesthetic. Um, so this is about 40 inches, I believe, tall. So it's just enough to catch all those hands walking down the hallway. Um, easy to clean, like I said. Uh, the blue boxes you kind of see on the sides, those are um, tackable panels. Um, one of the things we've, we've heard a lot and learned a lot from teachers is, yes, we want to display student work, but we don't want it to feel like it's a chore, like it's a blank space that we have to fill, otherwise it looks really bad. Um, so these, the, th the idea behind these is that they look nice if you don't put anything up, but you can still put student work up if you want to. Um, additionally, they help with acoustics in this space as they absorb sound. Um, I'll also highlight the blue, and if you look further back, the green. Each pair of pods has a color scheme. That helps with wayfinding, so students know, okay, I'm going down to the blue pod, and then I'm taking a left, or I'm going down to the green pod, and I'm taking a right. Um, just helps break down the scale of the building for small kids. Um, this is a view into the activity commons. So you'll see kind of flexible furniture out here in the center. Um, the, when the doors you see kind of straight back, that goes into a classroom, so that's that kind of nice, open, easy supervision from the classroom out to the activity commons. And again, those doors swing 180 open so that uh, the teachers can let students kind of free flow between classrooms and the activity commons should they want. Um, just to the right of that, you'll see that's kind of the, the cubby entrance, so where students will enter, put their belongings, and then enter into the classroom. Um, and then to the left, you'll see that's the view outside some windows that go outside into the courtyard. Um, one thing I think you'll notice is 
from pretty much anywhere in one of these activity commons as you're going to be able to see outside, which is which we think is really great. Um, media center. Um, and again, most of the furniture and things you're seeing are, aren't necessarily things we have selected or picked out. Uh, they're just representational to help give scale to the images. Um, they, will, they will change as we determine exactly what the needs of the, of the population are and the teachers and staff. Um, but kind of a large focus wall with some built-in shelving um, and some nooks for kids to kind of be able to crawl up into and read a book um, and, and just, some, kind of just kind of a nice place to be. And then the last image we'll show you here is the cafeteria. I promise you we will have more tables and chairs in here. We're not just going to feed 12 kids. Um, but uh, sometimes we get too much furniture in there and we kind of lose the space. So um, there are some wall tile and some acoustical panels to help with acoustics, some wood ceilings to kind of soften the environment and make it feel a little bit more homey. Um, and then straight back you'll see this is kind of an overhead garage door that opens out to the outdoor kind of eating space. So again, on a nice day, we can open up let kids kind of eat outside, get some fresh air, um, even though maybe they can't go outside and play just yet. So that brings us to Carmel. Um, this site plan probably has changed since you have last seen it. We've had um, a few meetings with the group that is developing the library site and tried to work with them to see how we can find some synergies and work together and make sure we're not impeding each other. So that, that drive you kind of see off to the I guess it goes north, but it's to the left of the screen. Um, that's a connection drive that will be connected to by the library when they build their new parking garage and parking areas. Um, coming in, uh, the we are reconfiguring kind of the entry sequence to the entry. It's kind of, currently it's kind of this weird Y shape, and it's just kind of confusing. So we're kind of trying to simplify that. Um, Right now, all traffic is going to enter there, buses and parents. That wasn't the ideal scenario that we started with, but as we've explored different options um, around the site of what, what else we may be, do, may be able to do, uh, we think this is kind of our best bet for now, and we'll see uh, what further develops in the future. Um, but um, bus, so we, we are still dividing them as quickly as we can. So once entering, buses will immediately take a right and come around to the back of the site where the bus loading zone is. Um, so that, that minimizes our interaction of parents and buses as much as we can. Uh, parents would come, continue in and then take the second right and come around to the front of the building. Um, stacking is not quite as much as we have at Carmel uh, or at Clay Center Road just because we don't have as much real estate. Um, but I think we still got to about 75, 80 cars uh, double stacked in those lanes. Um, and then additionally, if, if staff are coming in, they can come up that drive past the parent drop-off lane and turn into the parking lot park and go in. Uh, the playground uh, for this is, is combined. We will have the different types of equipment, so there will be a designated you know, younger kid playground and older kid playground. They're just going to be nearer in the same area just because we don't have as much square footage to work with. So that's kind of up to the north side you see there. Or I guess, yeah. Um, and then there's an open grass play area and kind of a walking track around it. Um, this is a similar feature to what's at the site now, uh, something that the community kind of expressed was, was a nice feature and we wanted to maintain, as well as the Carmel Parks and Rec was interested in maintaining something similar. So I think that's over all the site. Um, so here we have another video of this site. Um, kind of give you a better idea three-dimensionally what it looks like. Uh, the color palette for this exterior is also is different than the other one. We wanted to give each each school their own identities. Just so, just because they're the same building doesn't mean they are 100 percent the same. So the footprint is the same, but the colors, the brick, the masonry, um, all of that is different for this site. Um, the intention here was to kind of match what the color scheme of the library to create a kind of a cohesive campus feel. Um, so we're at the main entry again. Um, Admin area is your first spot there, courtyard, and then our first two academic wings. So on this side you'll notice instead of a bump out, there's a push in. That's because we don't have those two additional early childhood classrooms. But there is still an entry on that main north-south corridor that runs the building. Coming around the back, again, we're in the, the bus lot, just like the other site. Um, 
two academic pods and a courtyard. And then the larger entry courtyard where the LGI and art room are both situated there. And then the last pair of academic pods. We'll zoom in again on the courtyard. Again, the same overhead door that opens up with the subsequent one into the cafeteria so you can get a nice free flow through there should you want to or need to. And then those windows on each side go into the activity commons of each grade level. Okay. Windows into classrooms and then the other entry into that north-south corridor on the other side. And we've got our service and mechanical areas, mechanical yard, and loading dock. And those windows go into the cafeteria. And we'll zoom out a little bit from there. Taking a look at the inside, again, similar concepts, just kind of a different palette. Uh, we still have wall tile on the walls, some acoustical panels, and tackable surfaces. Um, just different colors, different textures, different patterns, just to kind of give it its own identity. Um, you'll see, again, blue into this first entry and green into the second entry. So that's a similar color scheme for both buildings in terms of color, but the, 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 the types of materials are a little bit different. Uh, typical activity commons, so you'll see kind of a wood look LVT on the floor that kind of transitions into carpet into the classroom, so there's kind of a, a cool dissolved transition. Um, the kind of masonry look you see straight back, that's actually a vinyl wall covering, so it's not actual brick, but it, it kind of looks like brick. Um, it kind of gives a, an industrial kind of feel to the space, which is kind of neat. And again, the doors to each classroom that open up, um, you can see outside from pretty much anywhere. And cafeteria. Uh, up high we've got acoustical panels. We still have the wood ceiling across the top. Um, there's some tile and wood accents on the serving wall, which we're looking straight at right now. Um, and again, we'll have more chairs and tables in there, I promise. And then the, the overhead door here that opens out to the kind of outdoor dining space. And then the media center. Um, again, similar concepts. We've got the shelving in the back. Um, it's kind of a feature wall for technology and instruction, um, some loose furniture, just kind of a nice, nice place for kids to hang out. So there's a, just a quick shot at both schools so you can see they are, they are the same but they are different at the same time. So, and that's all we have, which I hope was plenty. Um, <laughs> we'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. It's very exciting. We're looking forward to each step as we move forward. Um, I know that we've got questions, so um, we'll just move. Katie, go ahead. Um, one of my questions is, is um, as you know, well, I hope you know, we would like to have SROs in all of our elementary schools. Is there offices or what could be offices for them? Yes. Um, so when we started the design process, that was a question that came up early on. Um, we never labeled anything designated SRO office because it could be or it could not be. Um, but if you look at the admin area there, you see the reception. There's an office directly up that's not behind kind of the closed locked door. Um, that was kind of the ideal spot for the SRO officer. Okay. Perfect. Um, teacher storage? What are we looking at in regards to that and where the pods are? So each um, classroom pod has their own storage closet. So it's not always in the same spot, but it's usually pretty close. And then they're all equal in size. Um, so the if you look kind of as you come in to come south in that, there's a room that's called storage right off that kind of main hallway into the activity commons. So each, each, each grade level pod has one of those rooms. Um, additionally, there is a significant amount of casework in each classroom for teachers to utilize. 
Perfect. Um, courtyard security. How tall are those fences? Uh, I believe we have them at five feet, six feet, six feet. Yeah. <laughs> and then last question I have for now is, do the classroom windows open? No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So when you, when you show the picture of media center, it looks like it's open space now, not closed. Uh, when you said image. The media center. Right, the, the rendered image or the floor plan, I guess is what I'm. Uh, the, the later pictures, you have people, yeah. Is the, that closed space or open space? I guess closed from where? where? I mean, like it's like a classroom or it's just between classroom or other rooms? So there is a, so it's kind of, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer your question. Yeah, it's maybe you could just show the floor plan and yeah. let me know yeah. where the media center is. Yeah, so the, the intention was to give it flexibility to be able to do either one. Uh -huh. So if you look here, um, you see the Discovery Center, so that's the media uh -huh. center. Um, there's that main hallway that comes down the center. Oh, that so it is all enclosed. However, there's a, a garage door and, and several pairs of double doors. Um, and the, the hope or the intent behind most of the instructors is, what, is that, that, that during school hours, all those doors would be open um, so that kids could kind of free flow in and out. But should there ever be a need to close it so it's quieter, um, they can still do that. Oh, I was trying to find a media center on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> call we get, call we get creative with our names. <laughs> Okay. And another question is, so the new, new schools will also have a capacity of 750 students. Correct. And how is the total um, space compared to our existing uh, schools? And how is the class size? Yeah, how is the class size compared to, so class foot, compared to our average class size now? In terms of, you mean students or square footage? Square footage. Square footage should be pretty much identical to most of your newer buildings. Mm -hmm. um, the, there, this building is a little bit larger than your most recent buildings. Most of that square footage is in the activity common spaces that, that are much larger than most of your current buildings, um, which is basically extended classroom space. Okay, thank you. Layla, Pam? One down the road. Okay. <laughs> um, I just have a couple questions. First question: um, energy efficiency in the buildings. It looks like there's a lot of open, which I love all the open space, but I know that is far more difficult to maintain climate control. So, what type of um, what are we doing to help with that? Um, I guess are you meaning higher volume space or like the amount of exterior glazing? Um, higher volume space. Okay. So. Um, most of the higher volume spaces are, are similar to the spaces you have in your other buildings, the Discovery Center, gym, cafeteria. Um, really, there's been a lot of improvements in the technology in 20 years since you've built a building. Um, so everything will be Energy Star um, rated and LED lighting, um, so that'll reduce heat load um, and, and things like that. There's no um, passive green technologies in terms of like solar panels, um, wind technology, anything like that that we've explored. Okay. And um, the glass that's on the doors to the classrooms, what type of glass are we using? It's a laminated glass. So it's basically two panes of glass that are laminated with a plastic film. Um, and that glass is, so if it gets hit, it's not going to come out. It's just, it's going to crack and stay in place. Um, it's not bullet resistant by any means, but um, should something go through it, it'll stay, it would stay where it is. It wouldn't come out. Okay. Um, and that's similar to, say, a drywall wall. It's going gonna, it's gonna to perform very, very similarly to that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I asked in an earlier email. I noticed um, that there was no access for the mechanical room to the building. So is that going to be built in, and where will that be? Uh, yes, and that's, a, that's an oversight of our presentation graphics, so I do apologize for that. Um, let me find the. So the vestibule you see down here in the bottom left, there's actually a door to the north that goes into that main mechanical space. Down. Right there. Okay. So there will be a door there. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
the okay the art storage rooms those are next to the art room is that correct uh, um, yes th so that yeah. would be on um, your first design your first classroom look yes yeah, so oh, here again. you see the art room in the bottom right and then there's an art storage room and the kiln room adjacent okay so that in in this picture that green go down one more I guess I don't. Oh, two more. There. No. One more. Keep going. There. So that green area right there, that's the art room. Correct. On the very far. At the top left, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. Um, I have a question about the parent drop-off points mm -hmm. at, at Clay Center Road, whatever we're going to call that. Um, <laughs> Wondering why we have chosen to put uh, double stacking on the other side of the parking lot. Um, are, are, I guess are you referring to kind of where the where it turns around? You've got the, the parent front? drop off, then you've got parent drop off stacking, and you've got parking in between the two. Right. Okay. So why did we choose to put parent drop off stacking on the other side of the parking lot? Uh, it just allows us to increase the, the linear distance so we can get as many cars along that lane as possible. Well, I know that. They're going to be dropping off there. They're, they're, they're waiting. Off. They're, so, that's waiting or so queuing. Like five cars okay, so they're going to be going around into the drop-off and then dropping kids off. Yeah, they'll drop off at the front doors. Okay, that's so just the I'm just hoping there aren't any parents who decide to try to get out of that line early and drop kids off. Anyway, how they address that at all of our schools? Okay. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, since um, Katie brought up the windows, how come the windows aren't opening, or is there something, one, at least one window that might open? Uh, so typically, well, we we did mention the overhead doors that do open to the outside, so we do have those. Um, but typically, it becomes a kind of a maintenance issue of maintaining the temperature in the building. Um, because one teacher wants her windows open because she's hot, but another teacher is freezing, so she's cranking up her heat. Um, so it's just it's just hard for the the district maintenance staff to be able to maintain a, temp, a cohesive temperature in the building if everybody has local control. Um, there is some adjustability in the thermostats in each room so that we can keep kids comfortable. Ah. Um, but that's the main main driving force behind that. We don't see a lot of operable windows in schools. Anymore. Okay. That's it, it also, Pam, it also controls allergens getting in and out where we can, you know, use our air handlers and filters and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah. it, it does make it a, a better I just know I liked having my windows open. It was, it was <laughs> nice having fresh air coming into the room. Um, uh, okay. The secure area for eating, could you, could you bring that back up? with the picture of the, the thought. Okay. Um, and are the walls, you talked about the um, design, the, the uh, tiles on the wall are tackable. Is the rest of the wall tackable as well? I mean, can teachers put things up on the wall um, or they, just on the blue surface? So some of that's going to be um, a administrative level decision. Uh, it's just a, a painted chip board wall like you have in your house that's up above that so you can tack into it um, it's just a matter of the little holes that may be left behind and, of, and then having to do a fresh coat of paint over it okay because I know at Orchard Park we had I mean we could put anything anywhere on mm -hmm. those walls and it was really accessible to teachers if they wanted to put stuff up sure okay um, and the dotted lines I'm assuming on the uh, design for Carmel Elementary, the dotted line is the current building. Yes. Okay, so some of that we, can, we won't be able to do until the building is demolished, right? And so when will the building be demolished? Uh, the, no, we'll, we'll build the entire new building before the existing building 
is demolished. We're at our closest point. We're 13 feet away, and our construction manager has assured us that that's enough space for them to work. Okay, but we can't build all of the black top surfaces and the parking and all that until right. that's gone, right? Right, so um, May 2021, we'll, as soon as school's out, we'll move everything from the existing building that needs to come to the new building over. They'll tear down the existing building, and the hope is to have at least the parking lots in place before school starts. It will be a mad dash that summer to try to get that accomplished, but um, with such a tight site, there's not, there wasn't really a whole lot we could do about it. Okay. And I know we're starting Clay Center in November, so is there a reason there's such a difference in the start dates for the site work? Um, there's, there's, there's more site work at Clay Center because of the baseball fields and it's a, it's a brownfield site so there's more soil conditioning and things that have to happen before we can actually build. Um, I would assume that's why the construction manager advised a lot on the schedule in terms of how the construction duration would be handled. We also didn't want them to bid at the same time just because of the volume of work because we found that um, you know, if, you bid, if the contractors bid the first school and they don't get that job, they've got a chance at the second school. And uh, so we tend to get better pricing uh, if you, s I think we spaced them like a month apart or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just looking at the distance between the start for the first one and the start for the second one. And that, you know, that really pushes Carmel Elementary to get done. Yeah. It doesn't really, I mean, it's, we're okay with the schedule. It's, it, in some ways, it's just we have more time with Clay because we started the site right. work early. But Okay. But not to suggest that we don't have enough time for the second school. But. Okay. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Not to focus on the fences, but my assumption is those are also emergency egress areas that need to be kept clear if the plan was to leave the building. So it depends on the location of the courtyard, which I know sounds like I'm dodging the question. <laughs> um, but in the in the typical condition where the courtyard is between the two grade levels, the fence use, the fence has a gate. That gate is a maintenance gate only. It is not for emergency egress. The emergency egress route is actually back into the building and then back out. Um, the courtyard, uh, enclosed courtyard, is considered interior space. So that's how we were able to accomplish that kind of egress route. It also helps us with door hardware. Door hardware on fences isn't great just because it deteriorates over time because it's exposed to the weather. Um, there are a couple gates we could not get away from that. Um, the two at the cafeteria will have panic hardware on them and then there's one near the media center that will as well. Okay, thank you. And then I also want to thank you for working with the library. Um, that's an important partnership that we as a district have and we value that you're working with them and making the education campus um, there between the high school, the library, and the new school. Um, and then the question related to that I have is there's the gate to access their lot. I mean, I'm, there's the drive to access their lot. Mm -hmm. Is there a gate that we could close to control traffic when the parents are coming in in the morning so that we don't have people coming in two different entrances? Um, there currently is not. And it's definitely something we could, we could broach with them. If I remember the drive that, that you're referring to is coming out of their, um, oh, out of their garage. garage. So mm -hmm. it's, I don't think it would be reasonably accessible for like our parents dropping off and so forth. They'd have to go through the garage, I think, to get yeah, to that drive. Okay. Yeah, there's not a direct drive that connects around the back. It right. goes through the garage. Okay. And we are using the the drive on our property is two way so that in, you know, those big event nights that we can use the, the library garage's overflow parking. Okay, no, oh, Pam's got another question. Sorry, <laughs> you brought something up. Um, we had t originally talked about an another entrance um, around Carmel Elementary for the buses. Have, has that gone by the wayside? Um, we were looking at the possibility of having a south entrance. Right. And, um, but at this point, we've not been able to uh, secure the property in order to do that. Okay. So right now, the buses will be coming in with the parents. Yes. Okay. Anything else 
Dr. Beresford, Mr. McMichael, any of the architects or skillmen? I'll just say uh, thanks for your work on that. It's uh, inspiring. We get to see the 3D look there. It's uh, really getting exciting. And uh, the uh, seeing some of the interior coloring and, and uh, the different surfaces and stuff is really, uh, really exciting. Uh, you can tell it's going to be a special place for kids and, and teachers to do their work. So uh, we're excited about it. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I do have one more note. I think the personality, making them not the exact same building, I really appreciate that and then the things that we didn't think about making pods different colors so that kids don't get lost and parents don't get lost either so thank you and we look forward to the next update and at some point maybe there will be a ceremony to put a shovel on the ground thank you it's our pleasure thank you Next, we'll move to action items. The first action item is the CCS legislative statement and common interest. Uh, Mrs. Spannenberg. Thank you. Um, attached to our legislative statement, we included a letter for everyone to review. Um, little background. We had um, proposed at our last meeting and had a discussion about the way we do our legislative priorities. And the plan, Dr. Beresford and I were discussing an approach that would be more user friendly and not as dictatorial. So we, our thought was to have a, a statement, a statement of good faith and goodwill that we would be willing to and delighted to be a credible resource for our legislators as we move forward in in the the two upcoming sessions the short and long session with that we do have some areas of common interest that we've identified um, before you we have a letter with including the legislative statement and our common interest now this letter and the reason it was a little delayed in being attached is because we wrote a letter we sent it off to um, general counsel to ensure that the language would be most pleasing to those who are reading it and it would be well received by our legislators and also I found it very helpful we had a just a few statements of our common interest and um, Seamus was able to to add some other beef up the statements Let's just put it that way and um, I think he did a really nice job it is two pages but all, all of our the, the statement of good faith incredible resourcing is listed and we also have the examples of areas that we do agree and that we are more than willing to to help with as well as in those statements it does give um, some very positive remarks about what we are doing in our district what we are doing well in our district and why we would be a very credible resource for them to use moving forward during the legislation so that is what I have Dr. Beresford would you like to add any other comments uh, no, not m not much. Uh, you did a nice job explaining it. Uh, Seamus did add a little more detail and some exa more examples mm -hmm. than we had in our original draft, uh, which I do think is helpful. And uh, we actually uh, talked with our, our local legislators, um, uh, Representative Tor and Shibley, and, uh, and kind of talked to them about this approach, and they were very positive in their response mm -hmm. about it. And so uh, I think uh, you know just the message we want to send is that we want to be available as a good resource for them and, and w as they're trying to determine what they do with K-12 initiatives at, at the state level that they uh, they have someone they can call and say how that will impact us you know at the school level and uh, that way maybe we can uh, avoid some unintended consequences that, that happen when uh, uh, you know new legislation goes through and that sort of thing so uh, I think it's a great uh, a way to you know promote and uh, you know get our message across the things that we're interested in that we think would be better uh, you know for Carmel Clay schools but not just our schools um, these are items that a lot of different districts share these these same concerns and and uh, and same positives 
So uh, I think it's a good way that we can all work together and try to make Indiana, uh, like it says in the letter, a destination state for educators, uh, not, uh, you know, maybe we can up our game and, and get a better reputation in the nation as far as education goes. And on that note, one other piece I wanted to share, although it says, Dear Senator slash Representative, we will be sending this to the governor as well. Um, the governor has the, the education advisor that has reached out to Dr. Beresford, and he's already had some discussions with her, and um, we want to be sure that we share this with as many individuals who are impacting the legislation. Well, thank you, Layla and Dr. Beresford, for all your efforts on that. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the CCS 2020 legislative statement and common interests? So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Uh, one uh, addition. Mm -hmm. um, the word two on the on the first paragraph on the second page, um, where families and educators will want to live, work, and thank you. That was on a previous edit and somehow didn't make it. Okay. Yeah. I haven't had a real chance to read this because this was included late, but I'm trying to get through it. So thank you. If I have anything else, I'll let you know. Thank you. Katie? This is a small um, layout question for you. Um, since before, I know the previous drafts had it like with the um, issues, it was like name of the issue, name of the issue. And I really like the context. That was one of the things. But I was curious if there was a way that we could maybe do issue colon explanation or bold the issue so that uh, like a quick, you know, not that people will skim this, but if they did, that they could see our issues laid out very clearly. So I don't know if there's a way to do that, but that would be my own suggestion is not changing the content necessarily, but changing um, the way that those bullets, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could just highlight or bold, mm -hmm. like ESSA compliance or yeah, so just a way to, so that those yeah items jump out, or just changing the way that it it's worded. But as far as content goes, I have no issue. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay on the it says here are some specific examples of issues that we have identified. I would stop there because we've already said we want to give them help, so we don't need to state it again. Okay. Well, I, I think as we've discussed with our legislative priorities over the last few years, the key is building relationships. Um, and I think this letter goes a long way to doing that. And I think the conversation that you had with our two reps last week shows that. Um, we also had some discussion about there being a sheet that we would enclose with it. Can you go over that? I sure can. Um, so we'll have a two-page sheet that we will be having in addition to the letter. Courtney, oh, you were hiding. Um, Courtney is working on that as we speak. Um, one page will be our guiding principles, our mission, our vision statement. The opposite side will include highlights of our district. Some of the information that we've included previously and then additional information um, to put us in the best light and show that we have been successful in certain <coughs> ways and are really a credible, reliable resource for our legislators to, to use. Thank you. Do I have Pam? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, on the one that says disputes in a child's education are inevitable, um, we must continue to update our system. That sounds like it belongs to us. And I'm thinking maybe we should say the system of resolving. Okay. Um, and also, um, it says we are particularly interested in deregulating mandates such as teacher trainings. So. 
is there a specific teacher training? Are we talking in general about teacher trainings? Are we going to give an example of what we're talking about? Because we don't want all teacher trainings to go. Well, but I, I know there's one in right. particular where. Well, there are several teacher trainings that are a huge burden at the beginning of the school year right. for our teachers. Yes. And keep in mind that this letter is the first step that this all includes conversations with us so while we can be specific i don't want to be overly How about specific. surrounding teacher trainings rather than such as we might wordsmith that yeah. i can tell you that um, this is actually uh, a discussion going on at the state house and yes. so uh, they, the representatives and senators will, will get this reference. Um, I know. Because uh, they, uh, and it's not really a matter of getting rid of trainings. It's really about uh, a deregulation piece of it is do we need to do all of them every year, you know, for, or can you do one training and then do a, you know, re like a briefer version, like a, you know, an update kind of thing. Or, and, you know, what, instead of doing all the trains all at once, you know, in three, six hours of, of training at the start of the year when teachers start to get their classrooms together, can we break that down a little bit? So that's not a new concept at all. Uh, no, I know. There. I'm just thinking, so. uh, just I'm thinking of better ways to say things. That's me. Um, and, you know, we're talking about overburdening the teachers you know and as to what they have to do every year mm -hmm. um, so anyway okay can I just add one other statement or comment um, we will have an opportunity all of us will have an opportunity to meet with all of our legislators because we have the Hamilton the Hamilton County legislative luncheon that will be coming up in December Oh. Um, we are fortunate that Hamilton Heights is going to be hosting that on behalf of all of the schools in Hamilton County. You might recall we hosted last year here and that was very well received. Um, in fact, all of our legislators were able to attend, so that was quite exciting. That will be December 18th at 1130 up at Bex Hybrid and then Colleen will be sharing more information with us as the time gets closer. But she has sent out a, an email and a save the date. so. Each of us will have that. Um, it should be waiting for you when you check your email. Okay. Thank you. So this is an action item. So we will now, if there are no more questions, take a vote. Uh, all in favor of approving the 2020 CCS legislative statement in common interest, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. So we are approving the common interest, but we will circulate the letter before it goes out and have an opportunity if there are typos or other things to make sure that what we send to our legislators and the governor um, looks like a well done letter, which it, more typos, we will get rid of any. Thank you. Okay, so the motion carries all in favor. Thank you. Um, next item on the action item is adoption of the 2020 budgets, capital project <coughs> plan, and bus replacement plan. Uh, Mr. McMichael. Thank you. This information uh, was first presented to the board in August, and uh, after that meeting, uh, uh, authorization was given to advertise for a public hearing, and so on the 23rd of September, a uh, public hearing was held, um, giving opportunity for public comment. And now the third step in this is uh, we'd ask that the board uh, approve these budgets and plans. And then uh, if the board does that, then we will forward this on to the um, um, Department of Local Government Finance, for, and they will uh, review and, and finally approve. And, and um, eventually then we will uh, have approved budgets from the state as well as the plans. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. May I have a motion to approve the adoption 
of the 2020 budgets, capital project plan, and bus replacement plan. So, so moved. moved. Katie, thank you. A second. second. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, is there any discussion or questions? Well, thank you. As you, you said, Mr. McMichael, this is not the first time this is in front of us. Um, so we will now vote all in favor of approving the 2020 budgets, capital project plan, and bus replacement plan. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, next on the agenda is permission to advertise the bids for network connectivity upgrade. Again, Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Um, um, this is uh, part of the step that's required in order to be considered for uh, an E-rate project. And um, so we would um, seek authorization to advertise bids for, for this uh, internal computer network projects. Um, and you can see in the report it's at, at several of our schools, including Carmel High School. Um, this will upgrade um, that network, um, which will allow us to better um, manage the additional and emerging technology that we have. And um, um, if it's accepted as an E-rate project, we had, would anticipate that we'll get approximately a 40% reimbursement um, on whatever the cost would be. All right. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to um, approve permission to advertise for bids for the network connectivity upgrade? So moved. Thank you, Lynn. A second? Second. Thank you, Layla. Uh, any discussion? Okay, again, we've had this similar type of matter come before us. Um, so we will vote all in favor of approving permission to advertise for bids. Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, next on the action item is um, the 2020-21 program of studies course changes. Uh, not Mr. McMichael. Miss um, Valerie Peel, please step to the podium. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Beresford, members of the school board. Thank you for having us. Um, in addition to the um, course changes that I know Dr. Dudley had brought to the last meeting, we have a couple of additional changes that we just wanted to talk about briefly this evening um, with two courses that we would like to take a look at. As we have been exploring um, our college and career readiness options for our students um, in both association with graduation pathways and also community partnerships, we've taken a look at two courses that we currently offer through our career center through Jay Everett Light and it's been an outstanding partnership with Jay Everett Light provided students uh, great opportunities over the years to go to uh, that location and take some of these courses but in talking with uh, some of our neighboring school districts um, some other areas schools in Hamilton County we found that a number of schools have explored the idea of bringing these courses back to the building level um, and looking at some alternative ways to offer them through community partnerships. And so as we've explored this, uh, Dr. Harmus and Brittany Wiseman and I have uh, visited with some of those school districts and taken a look at what that impact has been on their programs, on their building, and they've been very uh, well received. Their enrollments have increased in these two courses. Um, typically, for example, this year we have five students in our certified nursing assistant program and four students in our, our emergency medical technician program. And other school districts, again, have very similar numbers to that. And when they brought the, the programs back in-house, their numbers increased to anywhere from 20 to 40 students in those programs. So it really gives students much more opportunities to access these programs. And we're going to talk about each one individually and the community partnerships. So this would be a modification of existing courses that we're offering that we're asking for you to consider this evening. So I'm going to let Brittany talk a little bit about the Certified Nursing Assistant Program. So right now, our students that are interested in getting a CNA, they go to JEL. It's two periods every other day, and they go for an entire school year. So it's a very large commitment for our students if they want to earn their CNA certification. Um, what we want to do is partner with a local business. It's actually Senior One Care Legacy, and they are based here in Carmel, and they train CNAs, and they also have partnerships with local nursing homes, retirement centers, and hospitals, and they help find CNAs employment and offer 
for that continuing education. And so through that partnership, what we would do is we'd offer it as a semester course. So it would still be two periods every other day, but it would only be one semester, um, which would free up space for our students to take other electives. Now when we look at CNA, typically I think, um, at least I know when I went to high school, I thought CNA, well that individual wants to go to a straight career cat career path to be in CNA. So that's a certified nurse's assistant. But what we're finding is there's a lot of two-year and four-year universities for students who are interested, let's say, in nursing or PA, and they're saying, if you want direct admit to our nursing program or our professional health program, you have to have a certification to show us that you're serious. And so we have students that are on the track of go to college and obviously some post-secondary um, other programs as well that would be interested in taking CNA. So if we can limit the amount of time that they're actually whether they're traveling because they'll be at school but also in the classroom that would be key. Now partnering with Senior One Care what would that would allow us to do is students would actually spend about 30 hours in the classroom um, and there's about 70 75 hours is that correct? Um, that they'll have to do at clinicals and partnering with this program what's great is that they're going to be here at local businesses so they're going to be networking it's all in Hamilton County and Boone County and they'll be networking with individuals so they actually can get a job um, so it'd be very nice if you're a 16 year old that's the youngest you can be to have your CNA to actually have that professional type position um, legacy also will work with us for our students let's say they miss a day um, here they can make up those clinical hours on the weekend and it's close to home and that's a huge positive piece and our students who want to go straight to that career path they can continue their education through legacy after they earn their CNA to get some of those specialties. CNA um, is it's definitely a necessity. They're finding that it's really hard to employ um, at home healthcare nurses. Um, it's hard to employ them at the hospitals. And so there's a huge job opportunity for our kids. In addition, um, partnering with Legacy, one really cool thing that I love about it is they want to give us two seats on their board so that way we can have a say in what they're doing within their business and what they're doing within the community, which is huge. And they're also going to sponsor two of our students to go to the HOSA State Conference. It's actual, um, right now we have about 13, 14 kids that go every year. Um, and those tend to be our students that are on the med school track. Um, and so while those students might take a CNA class if they're interested, it's nice that they're going to sponsor students that are also on a different track to attend those state conferences. So I'm going to turn it over to Valerie so she can tell you about the EMT program. So for the EMT program, we would partner with another company, which is Heartland Ambulance Service. And so that um, company it would be responsible for providing the instructor to certify for the EMT. The EMT class does have a little bit higher number of hours of requirement. They have to complete 165 hours of theory, technical, and hands-on experiences. In addition to that, they have to do 24 hours of field training outside of the class time. So there would be a requirement for the students that are doing the EMT to do that outside of the school day. They can do that by working in an emergency room, um, partnering with a um, police or fire department. We've even talked about, um, Heartland has talked about even working with like our Carmel Fire Department. We know we have medics at every football game. And so a student could potentially earn some of those hours if they were to shadow our medics, if our Carmel Fire Department, things like that, we can partner. And Heartland will help us arrange for those opportunities for our students so that the burden wouldn't be entirely on our students to figure out where they're going to get those additional shadowing hours. So they would have that opportunity. Once again, with the EMT, by partnering with Heartland Ambulance Service, it'll allow us to offer those classes on site at Carmel High School. It'll be a two period class for one semester. So again, it, it significantly reduces both the travel time and the classroom time that we are able to condense that by being right on site. So we think that would offer an opportunity um, for more students to be able to fit that into their schedule and have that option. 
Again, much like with the CNA, we see with the EMT some great opportunities for college, two-year, and four-year pathways for students. Um, we've talked to some students that have done this program that are going straight into the military. This is a great certification for a student to have that might open up some possibilities for them in military service. Students who want to go into firefighting or a police officer, this could be a great foundational certification. And then again, for some of those students that maybe are on a medical track, um, to get some of those entry-level skills and opportunities could really open up lots of potentials for them. So we see some great opportunities there. Also, with both of these programs, students will have an opportunity to earn dual credits through Ivy Tech for a couple of their entry-level courses. So if a student was going on to some of those two-year medical tech degrees at Ivy Tech, they would already have those credits. And dual credits in high school through Ivy Tech are free of charge. So that's a great opportunity. In addition, with both of these partnerships, um, all of the costs of the certification exams and all the other requirements that they need would be included in the course. So they would not have to pay any additional fees to cover any of those services. So we really see this as a great opportunity um, for our students to open up that access to give them some new opportunities and a great way to get into some community partnerships and really build that forward. So that is what we are asking for this evening. We're well, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Before we get to the questions, I need to have a motion to approve um, the 2020-21 program of study course changes to move certified nursing assistant program and emergency medical technician program from J. Everett Light to um, Carmel High School. So may I have a motion? Uh, someone approve the motion. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, now we'll open the floor up to questions from the board. Layla, go ahead. Um, at the EMT, the 165 hours of technical theory and hands-on experience, how will they get that in that in that one semester? They will because it will be a double blocked period. So they will take it for two periods a day every other day. So with that, that will allow them to complete that. So it will be a two period course. So it'll take two periods in their schedule. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Katie? Can you let us know just in relative to similar courses as far as course fees, is this pretty on par? Yeah, in fact, I think the, the course fees are going to be fairly minimal. Um, for the um, EMT course, they do have to purchase a shirt that has the logo on it um, that they wear as part of their training, um, and that's really about it. Again, everything else is going to be included in the course. Um, that we're working with these community partnerships. So as part of our partnership agreement, they are going to take care of all of the other costs associated with that as part of that agreement. Thank you. Pam? Uh, yes. Um, since we're uh, partnering with other people, who provides the instructors for these courses? That's, yeah, so they will be providing the instructors. Um, they will be hired as Carmel Clay School's employees, um, and so we will have the opportunity then to be able to evaluate them, be in the classroom, work with them. Um, so the um, emergency medical technician course, that is the same provider that um, Noblesville and Westfield are using, and they've been very happy with the instructor. We've received some good feedback. Um, Brittany talked to a couple people that have, have been in that class and have had really good feedback for that. So they do provide that instructor, but then it becomes an instructor in our in our district. So we don't get any choice in who the instructor is going to be then? Um, we, get, we do get a choice in that. Um, one positive thing is in order for us to um, get funding for the course and allow for the dual credit, they have to have their workplace specialist license. So ultimately, we have to approve that individual. And then um, our career center that we feed into, JEL, the director of that center, has to approve that individual as well. Um, and so we have already met um, the prospective instructor for EMT and have talked to families. Um, and they are very happy with that individual. And we have talked to, obviously, we've met um, some of the instructors at um, Legacy Senior One Care. We haven't, we haven't been told this is the person that we want. Um, but we'll get a say in that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are, we, we, the school system, will be responsible for the pay and the benefits for that person? Yeah, and, and again, that's the way the funding works for career and technical education courses. We get additional funding through the state for every career and technical education course that we offer based on the enrollment of the students. So we will use some of that funding to then pay 
the course fee, the fees that we have for these companies. Correct. Okay, fees, but so not the. You might tell them it's not a full-time position. Yeah, it, this would not be a full-time position. So we anticipate that, for example, the EMT, there would be one section of that. So that person would not be on a full-time contract with us. They would be paid the, the prorated amount of how many periods they're teaching. And what happens is, for example, in both of these cases, that person is probably also going to be working hours through these companies for them. So they're making parts of their, their salary that way as well. So this wouldn't be a full-time teaching position. Okay. Um, also, um, when will the students who are in EMT, will they be taking this, this class more as a senior? Because it doesn't make any sense to come into this class as a sophomore and then have it for a semester and then you know wait to be able to use it correct so both classes would be open to juniors and seniors um, for the EMT they do have to be a little bit older they have to be 17 to sit for the certification exam so if we had a very young junior um, we would probably work with our guidance counselors to say that that student might want to wait till their senior year in order to take the exam they can actually take the certification exam and then they cannot actually go to work as an EMT until they turn 18 but they can they can take that exam once they turn 17. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, and personally, I'm very excited to be adding these to um, the breadth of what we offer at Carmel High School. Um, we always get questions about Carmel High School being so big and the, the negative, but the response always is the opportunities are endless, and this is just one more example of that and to have more on site and not have to go over um, I'm very excited about that um, is there a minimum number of students that we'd have to have for each class in order to offer it there is um, they both shared that with us it's a fairly small number I believe uh, CNA said the absolute minimum was eight um, although they give us a little better price if we can get up to 16 so we're gonna work mm -hmm. on that for mr. McMichael um, and then uh, EMT I believe had 12 so the, the, it's a it's a doable number we believe with our student population okay thank you and so I, mean, I think the key is going to be to get the word out that this is an opportunity and um, I have a feeling that at some point you'll find one class is not enough but we'll deal with that when we get to it so any other questions from the board okay we will now vote um, all in favor of approving the change for 2020 to 2021 to add certified nursing assistant program and emergency medical technician program to be on site at Carmel High School please signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed no thank you motion carries thank you ladies thank you, thank you. Next, we will move to on action items. We have a number of policies that are coming back um, for approval. Uh, the first one is adoption of policy 0120.02 on nepotism and relatives reporting to relatives. Uh, I know the presenter is Dr. Beresford, but we also have members of the committee here. So um, Dr. Beresford, do you have anything to say on this? Now, actually, so we've been through this uh, around already, so uh, um, so I don't have any comments to make. Uh, so you can just move on through. Thank you. So, may I have a motion to approve adoption of of the new policy zero one two zero point zero two nepotism and relatives reporting to relatives. So moved. Thank you, Lynn. Second. Second. Thank you. Do we have any questions? No. All in favor of approving um, poli the new policy 0120.02, please signify by saying aye. Aye. aye thank you. All in fa uh, motion carries. All voted in favor. Next is policy uh, 0242, uh, professional growth requirements. Again, this was up for discussion um, last time. Dr. Beresford, anything that you want to point out at this? No. Thank you. So may I have a motion to approve the adoption 
of policy 0242 on professional growth requirements. So moved. Thank you, Lynn. Second. Second. Thank you, Pam. Any questions? No. All in favor of the adoption of policy 20242 on professional growth requirements, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Um, next is adoption of policy 0243 professional uh, meetings. Uh, Dr. Beresford, would you like to say anything? No. May I have a motion to approve adoption of policy 0243 on professional meetings? So moved. Thank you, Pam. A second? Second. Second. Katie, thank you. Um, any discussion? No. We will now vote to approve um, the adoption of policy 0243 professional meetings. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, next, we will move to adoption of policy 2120 employment of professional staff. Again, Dr. Beresford. No. May I have a motion to approve the adoption of policy 2120 on employment of professional staff? So moved. Thank you, Lynn. Second. Second. Thank you, Pam. Any discussion? Katie? I just have a question. Um, in this policy, we do list contact information. Um, if that does change, does this um, come back to the board? Or is that is that written into the policy? Do we know? I'm just curious. Yeah, when we designate uh, those positions, we um, um, typically would not change the policy. We just change the name, uh, you know, as, as they we as ch staff changes over time uh, but we do bring that to your attention um, you know as a sharing of information okay thank you did i click the wrong one i might have well good to know for future um <laughs> is it zero three six no, no. yeah i clicked two, the wrong eight. one well anyway for the future <laughs> you ever want to know about the contact information in the policy? <laughs> well, thank you. And keeping us out of that grind of just going boom, 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 boom. So, um, there being no further discussion on adoption of policy 2120, employment of professional staff, all in favor of um, the new adoption, the new policy, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. No. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, the last policy and the last action item for this evening is adoption of policy 4410 on promotion, placement, and retention. Again, Dr. Beresford, any comments? No. May I have a motion to approve the adoption of policy 4410, promotion, placement, and retention? So moved. Thank you. We're in a second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Thank you. Um, we'll now vote all in favor of the adoption of policy 4410, promotion, placement, and retention. Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any nays? No. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, next, we will move to the discussion items. First item up for discussion is the 2020 school board meeting dates. Um, I guess I am the presenter. Uh, they were circulated. Um, based upon some changes from a prior meeting. So um, do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Ren? Uh, I have questions about uh, the workshop in April. So uh, where it says April 13th is the music event at Campbell High School, and then the meeting will be, the workshop will be held on Wednesday, April 15th. So I just wonder uh, why it isn't Tuesday, April 14th. I think the thought process was the other meetings that we were moving, we were moving to Wednesday. I don't, is that correct? Or, what the uh, there's a parks board. board. I, thought it was a park I think board. that may be the, the reason we moved it to Wednesday is because that's a parks board. I think I tried to look up the parks board meeting. Do you meet the second Tuesday? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why. Uh huh. Because we didn't want to have a conflict there. And let me check September 1. So for se September, the regular session, the original day, will be September 28th, and then due to the religious holiday, we move it also to Wednesday, right? That, and then the Tuesday, September 29th, is not the parks meeting. Well, I, I'm assuming that 
the Jewish holidays typically start sundown to sundown. Okay. So my guess is um, Yom Kippur would start September 28th and end September 29th. Um, so that having a meeting on the 29th, if we're observing that holiday, is not appropriate. I see. Thanks. Then do you have a work conflict? Yes. So I'll be missing September 30th. I'll be teaching Wednesday night. Well, maybe that's part of the discussion. Do we want to move it to a Thursday? Or do we want to... Because if you're going to miss every Wednesday, we don't want to... No, it's just a September 30th. Just a September mm -hmm. The, right. the April 15th one is um, Carmel Redevelopment that Wednesday. So I would. Can somebody tell me what the music event is that we're supposed to be? Um, <coughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. The high school is having um, a music event, a legacy event at the Palladium, and all of the music instructors from the past to now will all be on. Oh, I'm sorry. All the music instructors um, that are part of the music department are going to be honored at the Palladium. And those who have graduated that are, um, they've got some different celebrities coming in as well. And so the board has been invited to, to join them. Oh, okay. And our students will be performing there too. Okay, so it looks like we've got a couple of dates to look at further. And again, this is just up for discussion. So um, we will bring this back up. Katie, do you have a question now? Yeah, um, Dr. Beresford um, mentioned to us, and we talked about it at our agenda meeting, about the reorganization uh, meeting. We do our board um, retreat slash advances, usually in January and July about combining perhaps the reorganization meeting in the regular session so that we can um, also focus on our retreat. But that was an item up for discussion. I just didn't know if we wanted to talk about that. Uh, okay. When you say combine the two, are you talking about making the reorganization meeting on the 27th? No. So the reorganization meeting would be on January 13th, and we would have that like we have typically had that in the past. And then we would potentially have an executive session or something that would be professional development. And in so place of the 27th? No, no, on the evening of the 13th. So after that, because normally the organizational meeting, and again, this we just had discussion about this, was normally that meeting is um, the new board members would be sworn in. Again, obviously this year there would not be new board members, but we would appoint the officers and then we would take the opportunity to use a meeting towards the beginning of the year to do some sort of board training um, and then space that out with the, and I'm old fashioned retreat, but I know it's the advance that we have during the summer um, so that we would have two um, board professional development meetings. Okay. If, if, for some reason, we're doing it on the 13th, because we do have to do that by the 15th. Um, would we put that earlier than 7 o'clock? Because if we're having an executive session or our, our, our advance or retreat, um, those usually take a little while. So I would not want to have it, it after 7 o'clock meeting. Could we do it at 5? Uh, I mean, I think that that's you know, open for discussion. I think the one point would be it depends who that person that would be leading us might be and when, when they could be here and then, um, but I don't see a reason that we couldn't adjust the time schedule to make it so that we're not starting a longer meeting at 7.30. Okay. Or, or even flip the order and maybe have the meeting at 7 for consistency and we would meet at 5 or 4.30 or whatever. Kind of short. I mean, our, our treats or advances have never been Aren't the short. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it is to replace the advance. It would be like this year we had the social media training. So the concept would be it would be some kind of training. And Dr. Beresford has sent an email, and he's really looking to us 
to tell him and for us to decide what we want to use that time for. Okay. Well, my two cents is I like the idea. Um, I would be in support of moving the train, moving our workshop earlier so we have a chunkier time afterwards. So. Th okay, thank you. That was what we were allowed to discuss, so we appreciate that. Um, next, we will move to oh, oh, Go ahead, Layla. So, I just, for my own edification, could we, ha so what we are discussing or what we have discussed is perhaps moving the 13th, the meeting on the 13th earlier. The meeting on the 15th is a CRC meeting. So, we've got a conflict there. So, that's something for us to note. And then, Lynn, the 30th. Is is you day. work. You work. So that's that. another time that we need to consider shifting as well. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we were covering all of them. So no. Th thank you for that summary. Um, and we will um, look into those dates um, and bring back um, the proposed meeting dates for next year sometime before the end of this year. Um, next, we will move to um, reports. Uh, first report is the monthly financial update. Mr. McMichael. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, we're going to pull it up here in a second. But um, So we're through uh, September, and um, you can see in our education referendum funds that our cash balance is uh, declining as we would anticipate. Uh, we're at about, it's over $3.8 million. Uh, that's, that's ahead of uh, last year's general fund and referendum funds, which we would also expect because as our budgets get larger, um, we want our cash balance in terms of actual dollars to get larger to keep up as a percentage. And so we're really running um, right on track with what we'd anticipate, and, and this will continue to decline and still, until we start receiving um, referendum dollars um, from uh, the fall uh, property tax collections. And then going to the operations fund, similar story here. You can see we're down to just $99,000. So this fund, um, because it's entirely local funding and primarily uh, property taxes, uh, this fund will, will tend to run into the red until we st and then we'll do interfund um, borrowing uh, until we start receiving uh, property tax. And, and again, we're, we're um, we were actually in the red this time last year on, on the operations fund, which again is, is to be expected given the nature of the revenue and the source of the revenue. So that would conclude my report on these, these uh, funds. Thank you, Roger. Do we have any questions from the board? Layla? I do have a question, and it, it's not entirely on this particular um, the education referendum fund. The, the question's more about the referendum that we currently have on the ballot. Mm -hmm. We've received several questions on how we can use the money mm -hmm. as well as how we're going to account for the use of the money. Does mm -hmm. it get thrown into a pot? How do we, what will it look like on, say, for example, a spreadsheet. How will we know how those funds are being used and how we'll be able to share that with the public? Um, it'll be set up really exactly like our current referendum fund. That is, there will be a specific fund, safety referendum fund, uh, so the money is accounted for uh, and it's not commingled with other funds. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. And then, like all of our funds, um, the uh, chart of accounts, there, there are specific account numbers that are used uh, depending on the type of expenditure. So if it's for um, reimbursement for expenses, or like now we pay uh, Karma Police Department for our current SOR officers. And so that would continue under the proposed uh, referendum fund, and except it would be much larger. And so, so there's a specific account number that's used to to make those payments and uh, and of course all of that's you know uh, recorded and as a matter of public record and anybody could review those uh, 
uh, revenue reports as well as expenditure uh, reports anytime they wanted to. And, and again, it's only what's different about the safety referendum and the current uh, operational referendum.